It appears that Adam is having some technical difficulties. He's probably going to hop out and then hop back in. Uh, he's frozen on his end. Not sure what's going on there with Adam. But you are inside the Johnny Dell Football Academy, and there is Adam. Yeah, his... sorry. Bad connection. Can you still hear me and see me? We can still hear you. That was that was awesome. I was like, man, everyone's probably wondering why I'm just sitting there staring at them. <laughs> An April Fool. I had my April Fool joke, like, ready. And then I couldn't even really deliver. Just the connection was not a joke, the bad connection. So happy April Fools, I guess. I don't know. Uh, we love technology. So we do. Um, a, a lot to get into, right? We're going to, we have a fun show kind of lined up because we're in the abyss of the season, right? Where there's like. We are in the leading uh, edge. We are in the leading edge of the off season, Adam. We are coming up to. Is that what you're calling it? The draft. I'm calling it that because okay. we're, we're in that moment where it's just anticipation for the draft. You know, a lot of the work is done. Uh, draft boards are being finalized for teams and we're waiting for news. We're waiting for Brandon Ayuk news. We're waiting for the draft to come around, but we still love our 49ers and there's still some great stuff to talk about, Adam. All right. So first of all, I want to ask how was everyone's Easter? How, how was your Easter Johnny? And cause you have kids Did you do the Easter egg hunt and all that. Yeah, we did some uh, around the house. You know, it's it's interesting when you have kids aged like mine. You know, I have a two, perfect age. Four, They're at the perfect seven age. year old. Yeah. Well, the hard part is like when you hide an egg that you don't think you've hidden really well, <laughs> but then you find out that that was way too complicated for your four year old because you know they have <laughs> they have a hard time imagining things that aren't visible. And uh, what's up, Trevor Dome? Hey, he brought me on his show uh, last week. We had a great time. It was awesome. Sent me a message. Was like, hey, can you do it? And I had a, I had just put a Boston butt on the smoker because I'm in Alabama and barbecue is life. Uh, and I was like, hey, I got to make sure this is stabilized. I got the firebox stabilized before I can leave it. So, uh, but it was fun. We, we jumped on and had a good time. But, you know, I, I would hide some and I would think, okay, you know, like, and I tried to give some hints, like we have this basket that we keep a lot of our, our, uh, like throw blankets and stuff in the living room. And I put one down in there and I kept telling my daughter, I was like, Gemma, the egg got really cold and I had to help it stay warm so it could go to sleep. And that one just went right over her head. And her and her older sister, my seven year old, she's sitting there going, sister, it's over there. And, you know, and she's getting mad because she can't find the egg. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's that interesting a age where uh, I have to be careful because a seven year old, she'll find anything that's in sight and, and imme yeah. immediately. So I have yeah. to hide things that are difficult for her, but also convince her not to go get all the eggs that I made a little easier for her sister to find. So it was, it was fun though. We had a good time, uh, hit them a bunch of times and they were, it was great. Um, but yeah, we're, we're buckling down. We're going to get some storms in here tonight for Alabama, but it's all good. How was your Easter Adam? Yeah, mine was pretty good. I am an ex basketball coach, so I was uh, glued to the TV. I live in Purdue country, I, I call hey, it Purdue country. That reminds me. Alabama. Sorry. Alabama. Right? Alabama. Hey, Alabama's man. in the top four, y'all. Like, it's I, not fair. Yeah, They're I, good at football and basketball. Like, get out of here. I mean, that, that, well, that's the thing. I, I was I was talking to somebody yesterday and I was like, hey, you know, people who hate Alabama have just got to be so mad right now because it's like yes. they even retires and they think, okay, finally, Alabama is not going <laughs> to be in some sort of sports championship for a while. Yeah, and, and then Nate the basketball team. And look, I will say that their head coach, that is a, a true Cinderella story and a rags to riches story. The guy like six years ago, 10 years ago, something like that, was a high school basketball coach at, yeah, a, Nate at a school. That yeah. was so small. He was selling like ch Cheetos and Mountain Dews out of his office to fund the basketball team. And here he is just signed a new contract as one of the, the most well-paid college coaches in the nation. Uh, and he's done a phenomenal job there at Alabama. Really interesting story. Go check it out. 
Yeah, very cool. I know a little bit about Nate Oates as I'm connected to basketball through my old coaching buddies and stuff. And we talk about guys like that all the time. And Nate Oates has been on our right our radar for a while. There was talk that um, IU would get him uh, years ago. And um, again, I live in Big Ten country. I live in Indiana. So IU, Purdue, um, teams like that. So yeah, very excited to see just the storylines. I'll give a shout out to the women's real quick. Who in the chat put in women, let's see, we'll put WBB. Put WBB if you're excited to see tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 o'clock in Niner country. We have Caitlin Clark going against Angel Reese in a matchup that was last year's final. And the drama where Angel Reese went like this to Caitlin Clark as they destroyed Iowa in that championship game. They play tonight. And I got to say, that's pretty exciting. Like the drama of it. LSU versus Iowa. Caitlin Clark, uh, Mulkey, the, the coach over there at LSU, she's always wearing something shiny and is like a big deal and stuff. And I, I'm really excited to, to, to see that, to be honest. So if anyone is watching that, um, put in WBB in, in the chat because I'm usually not huge on women's basketball. I'm just not. I'm just being honest. It's Niners football and men's basketball for me, but I'm I'm actually excited. So, yeah, it's March Madness. Um, it is April 1st, so we had our April Fool where uh, I thought I was off the air. <laughs> uh, so, okay, a lot to get into regarding the state of – the roster and i want to ask you if you saw first of all the on the on the niners page there was that uh the mock draft that had the lineman from arizona uh, with the 31st pick um going offensive lineman what your thoughts were and and up to the second what our roster looking back at all the Free agency stuff is about over, we would say. We're not expecting anything major, right? And so because of that, let's look at the state of the roster, what's needed, and then we'll kind of – and then look back at some of our favorite picks and some of the worst picks, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the biggest thing that happened right now with free agency is that the 49ers did offer – a uh a, a tender to a restricted free agent from the lions he's their number two yeah, tight end, tight end. A three year 12 million dollar deal is what they've offered him and the lions still have time to match uh, as of this morning i had not seen that they had chosen to match so <clears throat> it'll be a situation where you actually wait for no news uh you don't know whether or not that signing will go through until five days later and you haven't heard anything about the lions matching or not so it's an interesting uh guy he ha he had a big catch in the playoffs but he has dealt with some injury history hasn't been a big time receiving tight end. what you do what this does kind of reinforce is what the 49ers i think are are again gearing themselves towards which is value at positions that have been costly uh we've talked about the leonard floyd signing the gross motto signing about those are bringing an element that they need that they were missing down the stretch at a value i think this is that blocking tight end that you need uh when you look at his role with the lions a lot of times he was mainly a blocking tight end, and he was a very good blocking tight end. And people go, you're paying $4 million to a backup blocking tight end. And I'll say, if you have him in the game versus Braden Willis in the Super Bowl, you probably have a Lombardi trophy. <laughs> so I think $4 million for that player is worth it. Is $4 million on a backup player worth a Lombardi trophy? Yes. Because if you remember in the Super Bowl that we were trying to run it, George Kittle had gone out of the game. He was missing a little bit of time. They put Braden Willis in. Uh, I believe it was Elijah Mitchell ran off right guard, uh, or right end, and picked up like 14 yards. But there was a holding penalty on Braden Willis. And it was down at the end of the game when we had to end up settling for a field goal. Okay. So, like, that is a big deal. And it, it seems like, okay, that, that that's a lot for backup tight end. But, you know, 
I, I can see exactly why they they're they're doing this, and it kind of also then puts a position where Detroit not having budgeted for that for their number two tight end now is kind of in a bind. They were not expecting that to happen. So you one either get a player of value at a position that you obviously have need of a blocking tight end there. There's questions about Braden Willis and his blocking ability. Uh, he's got a lot of receiving ability. There's questions about Cameron Latu and what is he going to end up being for the 49ers after they invested a third round pick in him last year. I still believe in him, but you know, look, the, the future is not looking great as it stands right now off of his training camp performance last year. Now he was coming on at the end of training camp. So we'll see what happens there. As we look at the, you know, it, it, again, you're looking at the entirety of of the 49ers offense tight end position to me is thin, especially at depth. I think that's why uh, that's why they're going after this guy. And, um, and I, I, I think they're going to look to kind of bolster that throughout the draft as far as more depth. Um, and I, 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 I don't want to see them invest something like a, a first, second, third, fourth in tight end, <clears throat> but they need to get some help in that room. And they have some young guys, but um, but they they definitely need to bring in some reinforcements there. Yeah, I don't think Detroit is going to match. They they probably would have at this point in my in my mind. Um, my mic is keep going. I'll try and fix it. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, sounds like Adam is having some technical difficulties on the other side. Also, if we look at uh, the the offensive line, you know, we've talked about this. Tackle is a problem. I think center is something that they need to be able to upgrade. Right guard is a is a situation where you're not set. You're not you're not confident in that beyond John Feliciano. And so, offensive line to me, if you look at what the Chiefs did. After the 2020 Super Bowl, when they went in there and Patrick Mahomes was running for his life every single snap and yeah. they got really whooped by the Buccaneers, they completely rebuilt that offensive line the next season. I mean, completely rebuilt it. They they got rid of their entire starting offensive line that offseason. Uh, now, they had had guys that had injury problems, but they went out, they, they signed um, Tooney from the Patriots and they invested draft picks and signings like they rebuilt that offensive line and they've gone on and won two Super Bowls because they looked at it and they said, look, we have a generational quarterback. We need to protect him because you can't just get what, you know, you can't have the same result. You can't have this great quarterback and waste that. And that's what I want to see them do with Brock Purdy is don't waste Brock Purdy's career is don't sit there. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I've defended Kyle Shanahan's kind of penchant for picking run blockers and things, but that really bit them in the Super Bowl is that when you needed to be able to give Brock Purdy a little bit more time, on several key plays. I mean, my goodness, you had you had Debo Samuel wide open in the end zone. And Chris Jones is just left almost untouched coming at uh at Brock Purdy. And then you have another play where uh Juwan Jennings is most likely gonna be able to catch it and go in for a score. And you can't give him give Brock Purdy time because Burford takes the wrong guy. And I mean, you can't have these things. You can't have Colton McKivitz getting whooped on his side. You have to have a a, a a a plan to replace Trent Williams going there. So, you know, I, I want to go heavy there. I think they need to go late round in the tight end room. I think they need to go early in the offensive line room. Uh, I, I do agree with the mocks that say, hey, look, you know, the 49ers need to start bolstering that offensive line. They need higher performance they need better performance out of that offensive line you can have the greatest skill position players in the world you can have a great quarterback kansas city saw in 2020 you can have those things and still struggle to put up any points because your offensive line is straight cheeks so i want to see them invest in that now there's also other questions right uh, wide receiver room we know debo and iuk are at the top of that depth chart we know juan third and juan is there after that it's a big list of question marks you know they re-signed conley which is good i liked him 
I think he's done some good things. Ronnie Bell, big question mark. You know, late round pick guy last year. What's happening there? Ray Ray McLeod, most likely not coming back. What's the story with Danny Gray? Has just not developed as a player. He's not been able to get on the field. He's dealt with some injury problems. So, you know, what's going on there with Danny Gray? There's a lot of questions. I think if you're going to find some quality receivers, there are guys to be found in the third, fourth, fifth round of this draft. I've said multiple times, I think Luke McCaffrey is a perfect fit for this 49ers offense. He's a very heady player. He's a feisty player. He will get in there in the run game. He will understand the game of football, and he's quicker than he is fast. But he also ran a decent 40. Uh, I think his 40-yard time really helped him out. He ran faster than most people think, and he's he's taller and a little bit bigger framed than you would think. Uh, he's six foot one, and so you know he's the same, a little bit taller than Debo Samuel actually. Uh, so he's a guy that mostly played outside, but really who he reminds me of coming out is Cooper Cup is that he he has the same he looks the same when he moves i think it, positionally he's going to fit very similarly he's not going to be a pure outside guy to stretch the field you could put him out there at times but he's not going to be that but he will really create problems and matchup problems in the slot so uh, i really like him coming in there <clears throat> being able to bolster the wide receiver room. It's a guy I've really uh, fallen in love with, but then you have running back. Uh, are we going to pick a running back in the third round again? Uh, you know, look, the running back room, you have Elijah Mitchell who has shown that he, when he can be on the field, he's a very good running back and you can count on him and he will get yards and he runs hard and he, he does well in this system, but he has missed so much time that you can't count on him being available in that running back room. He has missed so much time. And it's just, it becomes a question of what do you do with that? Do you go into this season saying, you know what? We're good with Christian McCaffrey, Elijah Mitchell, who may miss 14 games this year. We don't know. He's done it before. He's, he's just consistently missed time. And then Jordan Mason and Jordan Mason has, I love the I love his running style. I love his running style. Uh, has had a hard time getting on the field. Has had a hard time, you know, assimilating into all of the offense. So, do they need to add another body in that running back room? You know, if Christian McCaffrey goes down, do you feel comfortable with just Jordan Mason and Elijah Mitchell? Because I don't feel like Elijah Mitchell can can really have a load and stay healthy. And I. Don't feel like Jordan Mason won't get Brock Purdy killed at some point. You know, it's it's hard. I think they're going to, as much as we hate to say, they're probably going to add a running back in the third round into that room. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, I think, depth needs and some starting needs on the offense for this team. They're, they're at a place where last year, I felt like they were really wide as far as they had a lot of talent in width. So start that starting lineup is just, is is really stacked behind that is a lot of question marks is that they weren't strong in depth and to me this year stay to this roster for the offense you need to add lots of depth how's uh my mic situation i thought i fixed it we'll see it sounds yeah. fine right now <laughs> so yeah, uh, man, so many, so many questions. This is kind of the fun time of the year where we just kind of place all of our, like, what I think is going to happen in the scene. We're not too far from the draft. Uh, a couple of questions that I want to ask from the chat, um, real quick. Strawberry Reacts um, had a good point earlier by saying, yeah, it was kind of BS with the holding call. But the question was uh, your reaction to what Kyle and Jed said at the owners meetings yeah it sounded like a lot of uh owners meetings comments i mean asked about Brian, brandon Ayuk, and obviously he's going to say we want brandon Ayuk to be here we're working on it we hope it gets done sooner than later that that's pretty much the same thing they said about nick bosa last year same thing they said about debo samuel the year before um you know it, it's it, it's just is what it is uh and, and you know Jed York saying that, you know, yeah, they're going to, they're going to pay Brock, Brock Purdy. I mean, th these were, uh, to me, uh, I didn't really see anything out of there that I was like, oh, wow, that was an interesting, it was just, you know, pretty much what you'd expect. Um, they're going to pay Brock Purdy, what we've talked about when that time comes. I think that's a no brainer. You, it's really hard to find uh, a, 
a quarterback at the caliber of Brock Purdy. And so you don't let a guy out of that building. Uh, just go look at what the Washington football t- commander Redskins have uh, been dealing with on that whole situation. And uh, when they let Kirk Cousins out of the building, they have not been able to solidify that spot at all, at all. And, and Ron Rivera publicly commented on that, um, that he was asked, you know, why are the other teams in their division, uh, being so successful and Washington has failed to do that. And he just goes quarterback, you know, they've, they've had stability at quarterback and they've had quality play at quarterback and we failed to do that. Um, when you let a guy out of your building, that is, is a, is a very good quarterback. It's really hard to replace that guy. Uh, San Francisco has done that before and they've had a really hard time replacing them. And so, uh, you know, uh, they're going to, they're going to pay, Brock Purdy. It's just, it's going to happen. And he's going to be very, very well compensated. He's not giving a, a, a hometown discount. That's, uh, it's not what's going to happen. He's, he's going to be very well compensated and, you know, just, yeah, you, you don't let a guy like that out of your building. So, um, he's going to get, get that extension and I'm happy for him when, it, when that time comes, it's now still going to be a year away. He, by this, by the, uh, collective bargaining rules, he cannot have an extension this year. It's going to happen next year. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they they structure it. But I'm assuming it's going to it's going to be something that they'll figure out here pretty early in the offseason next year. Yeah. <clears throat> what about uh, Dr. Steve? Always, always coming through with some some good questions to your uh, the best force multiplier on the line, the center, the right guard or the right tackle. Um, I think if you take center and move right. Uh, yes. I mean, really, uh, it depends on who you're plugging in there. Um, I think out of this draft early in the draft, your best force multiplier is going to be right tackle where I I think the better tackles are going to be near the top of the draft. And so if you want to get a guy who's going to be an upgrade over McKivitz, then you have to go earlier. I think you can find upgrades over, uh, on at center and right guard a little bit later in the draft that will give you the same thing. I mean, look, if the 49ers went first, third, third uh, on offensive line, I would not be that upset. Um, you know, th- look, this is a this is a roster that they've they've got to hit some draft picks uh, here uh, this year, next year in a serious way. They've been able to hit on a number of guys, but they've also had a little uh, some misses that have been pretty costly uh i'm looking at like drake jackson okay you've got to find a a solution beyond leonard floyd at that other defensive end spot drake jackson has not turned into that so you know that's a second round pick you've got to hit on on some of those Uh, you can't have those kind of misses and then you know we'll talk about some of the firsts here uh quite shortly Did I lose Adam again? I think Adam froze again. Adam is dealing with some some connection issues over there. But that segues us over into uh, a segment that I'm pretty excited about. Spent a lot of time this morning kind of combing through. And hopefully when we get Adam on, back on. Uh, yeah, there he is. He's back. He's sort of back. He's He's got some connection. Oh, there, there it is. There it is. He's not happy with it. But he looks clearer. You look clearer than you were. Um, but okay. we are we're we're gonna go through kind of, you know, being that this is draft month and the NFL has turned the draft has become an event. I mean, I remember, gosh, as a kid, th- the first time that that like the draft was really not just on ESPN, that was a big deal. And I even remember, you know, back late 90s, it was like the scale of production, even for ESPN in the late 90s, was nothing like it was 10 years later. The draft has become a true event. And so it's it's fascinating to look through some of the old photos and some of the old videos of the draft. I mean, it used to be like the entire team and their draft room would be at the draft in a big hall, like in six people huddled up. And every time it was their draft pick, they'd kind of turn in you know, like whisper to each other a little bit, trying to figure out what they were going to do. And if there was trades, they took a card and they handed it three tables over, you know, to somebody else. And, and it was all right there. Uh, now, I mean, it is this big pageantry and it all happened in one day. It was one night. Like it was just the draft. And now it's this three day event. Um, 
that has become huge. I, I, I think it's it's great. I, I love seeing, you know, the young people realize their dreams that they've been working so hard towards. Yeah. But there is so much pressure on teams to hit, especially in those early rounds. And so we've we've been looking all this morning through history of 49ers picks. And we've come up with our own separate lists. Neither of us know what they are of our top five first round picks for the 49ers of all time. Now this was a harder list than I thought it was going to be. I, you know, I knew like the top three names pretty, pretty quick, but figuring out those last two names was tough, man. There were some, there are some good players. The 49ers picked overall in, in their history in the first round. Uh, and almost, you know, Almost as hard and really painfully, we picked our bottom five first round picks of all time. Man, there was to me, there was a stretch there about 12 years where there was a lot of options at uh, the bottom five. I think Adam froze up again. There are some issues going on on his end. So let's just send some good vibes over to Adam and hope that uh, the Internet uh works better on his side but let me know in the chat we're gonna we're gonna go through this number five who would be your number five pick for the 49ers the the the, the fifth best um overall I'm, I'm trying to bring adam in he's he's starting to move a little bit there i i think i saw some eye movement people eye movement happened uh he's 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 on the struggle bus over there okay can you hear me yeah, he's so irritated. Y'all, y'all gotta know yes. Adam. He's got that irritated face. He's uh, he's like a medical patient that that you're trying to revive. Uh, get the defibrillator. Yeah. But I like to be so in control. Adam, before I lose you, yeah. Who is your number five? You're on the top five. I think best I was. Picks? I think I was going to go Ronnie Lott. Really, as number five? Wow. You think it should be higher? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I, w I was scrambling. So, I, I don't know. He Obviously, he's in the top, you know, he's in the top, right? Um, so, let, well, I want to know what the, what the chat is what the chat has and, and what you have too. Okay. So uh, now understand the 49ers have nine hall of current hall of famers that have been picked in the first round. So, you know, they're doing pretty well there. There's going to be some, some slights here and there's going to be some guys left off the list. Um, now my number five, Basically, all my all my five are in the Hall of Fame right now, and that that hurt me. We're gonna have some honorable mentions, but number five for me, night going way back, nineteen sixty one, Jimmy Johnson, cornerback. He cornerback. Uh, yeah. If if now most people are gonna be unfamiliar with his name, this is a guy who was four time first team All Pro, four time second team All Pro. Uh, his rookie year, he had six interceptions. He also played wide receiver, and he is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Pro Football Hall of Fame, and a five-time Pro Bowler. When you look at the the that team, the 49ers team from the '60s, he may have been their best player. And uh, and and I think if you were looking at a guy uh, that would fit an all-decade team, there he's going to make an argument to be in that. That so to me, I I don't think you could leave him off the list. I think uh, he did enough uh, in there that when you start looking at the that some of the other guys that were there, just the accolades were there, and a guy that that really you know now this one that one was really tough for me. I went back and forth because you also have to be careful about recency bias. You know, there's some players that have been with the team maybe over the last twenty years that I really wanted to put on that list. Are on that spot, but that's who I had. Jimmy Johnson, cornerback, picked six overall by the 49ers in 1961. That's my number five. So, Adam, what's your number four? We lost him again. Adam's gone again. Uh, 
We'll get his. Threw me off. Uh, okay, quick before we lose you again. What's your number four? Yeah, I, I was going to say Patrick Willis. Patrick Willis, number four. All right, all right. I can I can understand that. Uh, give it, give us when we when we release it. Give us a thumbs up or thumbs down in the chat there if you agree. Patrick Willis, number four overall uh, on the top five 49ers first round draft picks picked uh, 11th overall in the 2007 draft uh yeah i i like that now number four i had coming down the man who in who let patrick willis know he was induct being inducted into the hall of fame bryant young that's who i had at number four is bryant young there a uh, guy who came in and really elevated that 1994 defense to a new level when he came onto the team in 1994 as a first pick, first round pick seventh overall high draft pick and a guy that to me uh if if you put a better team around him during the latter stages of his career uh to me i think he would have been a, a no-brainer first ballot hall of famer i think he was his second or third year of eligibility he made it to the hall of fame but um was a guy that i mean he was the best guy on that team for years i will never forget the time i believe it was 2004 or 2005 when the 49ers were, I believe it was 2004, playing in Mexico City. Uh, I remember I was in college at the time, and I watched the game because we didn't get TVs in our dorm rooms. We had a big, giant projection TV out in the lounge of our dorm. I went out there to watch the uh, the 49ers play in Mexico City, and I will never forget Bryant Young just fighting that entire game. The 49ers got the got the pants beat off him by the Cardinals and uh, Bryant young. I remember him getting a sack late in that game as a fourth quarter. The defense had been on the field almost the entire game because the offense was horrible. That's why I'm pretty sure it was 2004. Uh, Alex Smith was not on the team yet. And, uh, but Bryant young fighting and, giving what he did his entire career. It was the epitome of who Bryant Young was, that he was going to fight and he was a high motor guy and he was going to give every bit of effort from the beginning of the game to the end of the game, no matter what happened. It didn't matter that the offense was not holding up their end of the deal. He was going to do everything he could to try and get the 49ers a win. And so he was fighting. And, and, and at that elevation, you know, it's way up there. We know from when the 49ers played there last year uh, that that ele or two years ago, excuse me, that that elevation is a serious deal. Um, and guys struggle with that. And just seeing him exhausted, just, just sucking air, trying to get, enough energy to go and play another snap and and he got, he did that after a sack so bryant young i think the epitome of what it meant to be a 49er uh he's my number four overall a uh, first round pick now for number three coming in at number three is who adam had at number four and that is patrick willis and for me Patrick Willis. Now, this may be a little bit of recency bias in that, you know, Patrick Oak was more recently playing with the team. But I think Patrick Willis, when you look at the level of play comparative to the rest of the league, you know, Brian Young was a very, very good player. But he was there was always an argument. Was he, you know, was he a top five guy during his era when you had guys, um, you know, around the league? Warren Sapp, for example, who was out there and uh, and, and different guys that are, were very good uh, defensive tackles that he was it was always, you know, he felt like he was always kind of second or third or fourth down the list for Patrick Willis for much of his career. He was undoubtedly the number one linebacker in the league. He could do things that no other linebacker could do. And so for me, looking at what he did and, and him ushering in kind of the, the building of that roster for the Harbaugh era was something that, uh, and, and the, the heart being the heartbeat of that team and the success that they had over uh, those three years that he was there, I think to me um, that Patrick Willis, number three as the 49ers top five draft picks. Uh, again, a guy that I think he played uh, at poor Adam. He's just really on the struggle bus. Uh, I, that Patrick Willis was a, a higher level of player 
around to comparative around the league than than Bryant Young. It was close, though. Those two were really tough for me to get there. Um, and so maybe when Adam pops in, we'll hear when his number three. So moving on, number two on the overall top five first round picks. I am going with the hitting legend, Ronnie Lott. I I do not have Ronnie Lott as far down my list as Adam did. I have R- Ronnie Lott as the number two uh, pick for, uh, as far as number two, top five, 49ers first round picks of all time. He was picked eighth overall. And again, the reason why I have Ronnie Lott higher than Bryant Young or Patrick Willis, because uh, the guy, one, w- has all the accolades, and two, he's got those championships. Now, yes, Joe Montana is a huge part of that, but Ronnie Lott, was uh you know he was he was a big hit when he he came on the scene no uh, pun intended but Ronnie Lott I think you know the the epitome of what it meant to be that 80s defense for the 49ers and and was the yin to the yang the offense was known as the finesse offense and it was all this razzle dazzle and and you know short dink and dunk passing game and all these things that they were going to finish you to death. But Ronnie Lott was going to hit you out of the stadium. He was the enforcer back there. And he, he like they had to start changing the rules eventually because of guys like Ronnie Lott, because back then you didn't have a lot of teams throwing over the middle against cover three. Uh, Ronnie Lott was back there as a, as a free safety in cover three. Uh, you had to be real careful throwing down the seams throwing anything short over the middle, which is where cover three tends to be a little soft in because Ronnie Lott was going to kill your wide receivers and guys would just refuse. They would stop running if they knew Ronnie Lott was there and they knew he was closing because they were going to get their head taken off. So he, he allowed George Seifert to be able to play cover three and really then take everything away in the middle of the field. You cannot take like it, really was a middle field closed defense. When Ronnie Lott was there, the middle of the field was closed for construction. It, you did not go through there. You did not pass through. It was not happening. And when you can do that, when you can take away the, com- the uh, completely the middle area of the field, that makes it really hard for an offense. And Ronnie Lott, I think he, he was, uh, it, again, we're talking about a guy who had the end of his finger cut off so he wouldn't miss time in a playoff game. I mean, come on. That is that that's amazing. Ronnie Lott for me, number two overall. So as before we get to number one, though, I'm going to give some honorable mentions here because th- this was a tough list. And 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 let me know if if I went a little overboard on on one of these. Now, a guy again, he's only been on the team not that long, but it's really hard not to say he should at least be an honorable mention and will probably crack this list at some point is Nick Bosa. I think Nick Bosa, you could make an argument for him being on there, but again, he ha- he doesn't have that long career, but I mean, defensive player of the year, defensive rookie of the year uh, is a guy that is looking like he's almost going to be a surefire uh, Hall of Fame career ahead of him. Another guy, Harris Barton, uh, left tackle. He was drafted by the 49ers, and he was a guy who protected uh, Joe Montana for a long time. He was a first-round pick. Um, Y.A. Tittle, you know, he's a Hall of Fame quarterback. Now, he doesn't have the accolades of Steve Young, of Joe Montana, but I think, you know, a guy that when he's a Hall of Fame quarterback and he kind of set the standard for quarterback play in San Francisco, Y. A. Tittle that was was on there, and, and I, he's a guy that's hard to at least not give an honorable mention to. Uh, Leo Nomalini, he was a guy again, Hall of Fame talent early on, uh, a, a pick a long time ago, nearly seventy years ago now uh, for the Forty ers So, um, you know, he made my honorable mentions list. Hugh McElhenney, uh, he was another guy, Hall of Fame talent, long time ago, a uh, guy who really was productive when he played, a guy that. Um, you know, and let me know this. This one maybe maybe uh, uh overreaching a little bit. Julian Peterson, I put him on my honorable mentions list because I think it wasn't just what he did for the 49ers. He had a very solid career, even you know going to a Super Bowl there with Seattle, and uh, was a guy that it pained me when the 49ers let him go because they were in cap cap hell when they had to let him go to Seattle, but. Uh, I loved the way he played. I mean, he was a, an athletic freak, an absolute athletic freak. 
uh, as a guy that that really was able to was a big part of that 2001 2002 49ers team that went to the playoffs and was kind of their last real push to try and do something Julian Peterson was a fantastic linebacker and was a guy that he could rush the pass or he could drop into coverage he could he could run uh with a tight end down the middle of the field and so he made my honorable mentions list. Vernon Davis uh, was a guy. Now, I, I always felt like Vernon Davis never quite reached where he could have. His promise coming out of Maryland was so was so big. I mean, we're talking about a guy, 255 pounds, run, ran a 43840 at the combine and uh was was bench pressing out of those out of the gym. A guy that was just an absolute athletic freak. And you wished he would play, he would have played like George Kittle does, you know, with that physical intensity to just run guys over. Because if he had played like that, it felt like there was nobody else in the league who could have tackled him because he, he was almost like a bigger uh, uh, Steven Jackson. You know, Steven Jackson was a guy that just trucked the entire league. And Steven Jackson was like 230. And Vernon Davis had 25 pounds on him, was faster than he was. And, uh, you know, with with the the struggles that teams had just tackling Stephen Jackson, he was like you always wished that Vernon Davis ran more like that. But it was like he was always trying to run around everybody and juke everybody and jump over people. And it was like, dude, just run through everybody. And I remember, I remember there was a a clip of Patrick Willis mic'd up on the sideline, and Vernon Davis came to the sideline and and he had tried to jump over a guy into the end zone and, and kind of landed weird. And uh, I think it was he was running to the sideline, and Patrick Willis was was looking at Vernon. He's like, man. Just put your shoulder down and run that little dude over. Like, that's what you always were wishing for from Vernon Davis. But, you know, uh, still was a guy that at, really turned his career around from his early years and became a huge part of the 49ers. Catch three. You will always remember that. And then this was this was probably the hardest one for me to not have on the top five list in my honorable mentions. And uh, Joe Staley. That's Joe Staley. You know, the consummate. 49er what's has has represented everything it meant to be a 49er has been through the deepest lows the team has had has been at some of the highest highs the team has had over the last 20 years um Joe Staley uh, great player will surely be in the Hall of Fame you know I I really struggled with Joe of of leaving him off of the top five, but, uh, I got Joe there. Everybody knows Joe and the Joe show was, was always amazing. Um, another honorable mention, Eric Armstead he has a guy didn't quite make it to that 10 year mark with the 40 ers but has played nine seasons with them. A number of them really productive. Now it may be reaching in to put Armstead on the top five, but it felt weird leaving him off at least an honorable mention because he was a, a good player and, has been with the team, you know, for as long as he has, and has had some really productive stretches and has been a big part of, you know, two teams that have gone to the Super Bowl. So, uh, you know, had a hard time that, but I also then can't put art Eric Armstead, uh, include him in honorable mentions and not mention DeForest Buckner, who I think was the better player. I think many people will look at it and say, yeah, you know, DeForest Buckner is a better player and he's, He's not on the team, not because of lack of talent. He's not on the team because of front office decisions. Uh, now, again, people have argued this to death. It's it's happened. It's it's over. I'm not going to talk about that. But DeForest Buckner, you know, one of the top defensive tackles in the league has been and has been since the moment the 49ers drafted him. So DeForest Buckner for me on the honorable mention. So that, that rounds out my honorable mentions list. I think um, some other guys were, you know, it's it's hard. That would be if I was looking at, you know, my top all time first round picks. Those are the guys that I would mention there. I think every, there's there's, you know, the top five and then everybody else is down just a step. Joe Staley's hard on that one. I, Nick Bosa will, will eventually be there. Might have to just extend it to top seven. And then, you know, everybody else after that was uh, at, at a different tier. Um, so my number one. 49ers first round pick of all time, obviously. Jerry Rice, the GOAT, drafted 16th overall with Bill Walsh making the note, Lynn Swan with more speed. That was his draft note on Jerry Rice coming out, is the guy, career leader, 
in all-purpose yards, career leader in receiving yards, scored 22 touchdowns, receiving touchdowns in a 12-game season. Uh, Super Bowls, everything. I mean, it's Jerry Rice. I, I saw him there at the Senior Bowl uh, cheering his son on. It was awesome. He was cutting it up with Terrell Owens. Uh, so that's my top five overall list. Now, now, let me know. Thumbs up, thumbs down if you agree with it. Now, we're going to move into the realm of pain. Almost, you could say, actually, uh, more fun. I almost had a little more fun trying to figure out the bottom five, the worst First round picks by the 49ers all time. Uh, this is the list that you're really hoping that a guy does not get on this year. Because we don't want a guy to make the, to be on this list. And uh, I'm going to go through some honorable mentions on this one first. So honorable mentions. Joshua Garnett. He's my he's on my honorable mentions list. He was a kid. If you remember guard uh, that was picked, um, he was picked by Chip Kelly to be, you know, the guard of the future. He was a, a an end of the first round was a guy that was supposed to have super quick feet, able to um, move and, and really play that inside or tight zone of Chip Kelly's offense really well. And then Chip Kelly gets fired and Joshua Garnett really struggled to even see the field. And when he did, he was getting whooped in pass protection every single time. And so then uh, the 49ers come in, they look at Joshua Garnett and they say, all right, uh, Kyle Shannon says, look, you have got to drop some weight. You've got to increase your lateral mobility. This is not a tight zone anymore. We are a wide zone based team. They uh, really challenged with that. Apparently he tried hard, but just couldn't do it and really ended up washing out of the league. So that was honorable mention for worst five picks of all time. First round picks. Uh, another one, Solomon Thomas. Now this guy, again, this is one, if he was picked at the end of the first round, I would not have included him in the all all in the honorable mentions because it wasn't like the guy has not at least had a, an NFL career. He's still playing with the jets, uh, you know, for a guy that has been much bemoaned by 49ers fans. I mean, he's still in the league and he's still uh, playing some spots here uh, that, uh, you know, and he's not like an, an every down player, but he's still a rotational player and he's still uh, been productive there over with the jets and Robert Sala and a guy that has now, you know, seven years into the league uh, to make it the, as long as he has is, is something now, the reason he's on the honorable mentions list is because he was such a high pick in the draft that the four Niners really were reaching when they picked Solomon Thomas. So yeah, Solomon Thomas there. Um, he's on my honorable mentions list and out of the same draft, Reuben Foster, uh, Reuben Foster, you know, was going to, was supposed to be, was supposed to be our Fred Warner, our Dre Greenlaw. He was, you know, kid out of Alabama, has all the talent in the world. He's still playing, just not in the NFL. He's been playing in the UFL. Uh, so if you watch the UFL and the XFL that's going on, uh, he plays with the Birmingham Stallions. You can still catch Reuben Foster. But, I mean, his his speed, his tackling ability, his ferocity in hitting was something there. And, you know, he played, uh, he, when he was on the field for the 49ers, he was, he was really good. But had all the off-the-field problems and then a guy picked around the same range as Reuben Foster Kentuan Balmer I will never forget the day I was watching the NFL draft and Mike Mayock was sitting there and they said you know the 49ers are up next in the first round here Mike who, who do you see uh, them picking and he said you know I really like this kid Kentuan Balmer out of uh out of I'm trying to remember. I think it was North Carolina was where Kentuan Balmer is from. But but he he sat there and, and said he really thought the 49ers were going to pick Kentuan Balmer. And then they turned around and picked him. My old Mike Mayock. Uh, you know, he sit there and talk about it. And he's, he's, he's a kid that really, you know, he's got a lot of upside to him. Uh, that was Mike Mayock. But then uh, Kentuan Balmer was supposed to be a kid that was going to come on and really solidify and help uh, improve that defensive line. Never really worked out. He had a decent NFL career. He played a number of years, went on, played in Seattle for a little while, but uh, did not really 
come in to be the player that they thought he was going to be in the first round. Um, now another guy, now this was one I was, I looked at, at this stretch. I was like, dang, they had some bad picks. Uh, Kwame Harris. That's probably a name that you have not heard for a long time. Uh, Kwame Harris. He was a kid that was picked as a tackle. Uh, he was tr he was trying to come in and he was going to be a, a guy that they were going to rebuild the offensive line around that he was going to be that great tackle he had mobility he had length arm length he had uh the ability to get to the second level he had a lot of things but dude was a hold machine i will i Remember so many times there'd be a play uh, where the 49ers would get a big passing play like to uh, Antonio Bryan or something. And then there would be a flag holding 49ers. I believe it was number 71. I think that was what Kwame Harris's number was, if I remember right. Let me know if you remember what Kwame Harris's number was. Kwame Harris. Uh, he was a terrible tackle and really uh, the epitome of that early kind of mid 2000s NF or 49ers team. Another kid that I made that made the honorable mentions list, Mike Rumpf cornerback out of Miami. I remember when he was picked, I remember going back Steven Jackson. One time Mike Rumpf's out there playing cornerback. He went to tackle Steven Jackson dove at him. Steven Jackson's shin made contact with his forearm and straight snapped Mike Rumpf's forearm in half. Um, he missed like eight weeks, some eight to 10 weeks, something like that. He was, I believe the number 24th overall pick that season was supposed to be able to come in and really replace Ahmed Plummer, who had been a, a very uh, a good corner for us, but had dealt with some serious injury problems over the years. You know, if you met, remember Ahmed Plummer, he was a guy, he had like seven interceptions. I believe that was in 2001, uh, had six, I think in 2002, he was a really good corner when he was able to be healthy, uh, then had some injury problems. And Mike Rumpf was brought in to be the replacement for, uh, Ahmed Plummer. And he was just terrible. Now he was supposed to be this amazing corner. He had big, tall size physicality was really going to bring some physicality there on the end. And he did not. And uh, he only played a couple seasons for the four Nanners and was out. And so that's my honorable mentions list for the bottom five first round picks by the 49ers. Now we're going to move to number five on my list. Worst first round picks drafted 26 overall in the 1997 draft. Jim Drunken Miller. Jim Drunken Miller. I know people were putting Gio Carmazzi there in uh in the the dra in in the chat. Gio was not a first round pick. Uh, Gio was was and the reason the 49ers ended up having to draft Gio was because Jim Drunken Miller did not work out. Jim Drunken Miller was actually the guy drafted. He was again end of the first round pick they had Steve Young but Steve Young was dealing had had was coming off a year with a, a with a bad concussion and they didn't know the future of Steve Young going forward and Jim Drunken Miller they invested a late first round pick in Drunken Miller uh which the name always checked out that um that that he was to be the heir apparent to Steve Young because Drunken Miller didn't work out, they ended up then having to draft a quarterback again in the infamous draft where they picked Gio Carmazzi instead of Tom Brady. Uh, and so they ended up, you know, having to have back to back failed quarterback projects there. And Jim Drunken Miller was a much higher draft investment. And he really never worked out in the league, uh, was obviously not the heir apparent. And when you miss on a first round quarterback, it's, it hurts a team. And really this is what led to a, a long time of the 49ers really struggling there after the 98 season, you know, when in 99 that, that uh, Steve Young, you know, had that horrible concussion and they were so bad. And then 2000 and then 2001, 2002, they were able to hit a resurgence with Jeff Garcia, but then we're not able to keep him on a contract on the contract they had. So, and and part of the waiting that goes into that went into my list uh, is was actually where a guy was picked. You know, it, obviously if they're picked higher, that's a that's a worse worse hit than than other guys. So 
Uh, so that was my number five overall pick. And, and I remember uh, hearing Drunken Miller's name or seeing that on there. And it's just, you know, it made you chuckle a little bit. Like, really? Like, Drunken and Miller? Like, that's just, that's a name that just, it made sense. But not a quarterback. You don't want a quarterback with that kind of name. Anyways, number four overall in my list is Ken McAfee. This is going back a little ways. Ken McAfee drafted seventh overall by the 49ers, a tight end in 1978. Now, you may be going, why of all those other honorable mentions did, you know, a guy, Kwame Harris, would you put Ken McAfee? Well, the reason why, again, it had to do with draft slot. I think uh, Kwame Harris was picked 24th overall, and Ken McAfee was number seven overall. He was a high draft pick. And this was during that time, right after the, the DeBartolos had bought the team, that they were trying to do a quick turnaround and really rebuild the team. Uh, it was right around the time you know they traded for O.J. Simpson, and they were trying to really build a, a competitor then. And Ken McAfee was drafted in uh, 1978, and he really only played two seasons. He had very little production, had like 22 catches his first season, had a handful of catches his second season, did have four touchdowns, but was not a high-caliber tight end. And there was a reason the 49ers went and got uh, went and got Dwight Clark. Now he played wide receiver slash tight end, but Ken McAfee was not that great. And... Uh, and they actually asked him to play guard, to move to guard from tight end in his third season. He said, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to go play. I'm not going to play guard. And so he retired from the NFL and went and enlisted in dental school. His draft rights were traded to the Minnesota Vikings and he never played for them. So he was a guy that was out of the league by his third season, number seven overall pick. That's a bad pick. That is a that's a that's a rough day at the draft when your number seven overall pick is out of the league within three years. So that was why he was on my top five. A guy that probably most of us have not heard of. Um, if you're anywhere around my age. And Cubs, three E B. He's on the vibe for my number three of my top worst picks of the draft. A.J. Jenkins. A.J. Jenkins. He was a guy who was brought in. This was the bulky era. Uh, it was 2012. He was brought in. The 49ers needed. They needed to, uh, to, to really elevate that wide receiver room. They needed to uh, bring in somebody who could be a top wide receiver and really help take the top off the defense. Um, they had lost Randy Moss to, uh, to, to retirement. He, he had kind of played out his time there with the 49ers and they brought in AJ Jenkins to be a guy that uh, was going to be the real true number one receiver there uh, for the 49ers. And he really never worked out. I believe he had one catch his entire career. Uh, didn't even start a game and ended up getting traded to the chiefs and, uh, and, you know, the Chiefs and, and the 49ers at the time, they kind of traded picks to see, you know, got failed first round picks to see if uh, maybe a guy in a different setting could, could re, you know, find their career. Never really did. Washed out of the league. Terrible pick. He was there, uh, I believe it was pick number 31 that year in the draft. A.J. Jenkins, terrible pick. Did not work out. Now, these the, number two and three were really tough for me because it was very, very similar careers. Very similar things. But the reason why I put the guy at number two over, num over A.J. Jenkins uh, was because he was picked sooner in the draft. Again, the, the draft uh, ordering and where they were picked did, did wait into this. So, number two, the worst... First round pick for the 49ers of all time was Rashawn Woods. If you remember Rashawn Woods, uh, what had happened was this, this was, again, the 49ers had to let Jeff Garcia go. They were coming off of their time in 2001, 2002. When they made it to the playoffs, they fired Mariucci. And I love Mooch, but they fired Mariucci. And they traded Terrell Owens to the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. They picked up a defensive player. I think he was a defensive end. He 
did not play much, didn't do it all, and a fifth-round pick. They basically traded him for a bag of peanuts. Uh, they traded Terrell Owens to the Philadelphia Eagles, and then they turned around and drafted Rashawn Woods that same year, just a couple months later, as the heir apparent. You know, they were letting... Terrell Owens go. He was having all these personality problems in the locker room. They really couldn't afford to pay him. They didn't want to pay him. There was all these things going on there. So they let him go and they draft Rashawn Woods, who then turns around and selects as his jersey number 81. Terrell Owens' jersey number. If you remember when this happening, I remember him him holding up that number 81 jersey, and it was the next Terrell Owens because he had the speed. He had the, the size, the physicality. He reminded you in a lot of ways of Terrell Owens, Rashawn Woods, and he was going to be the guy who was going to be the next number one wide receiver, 24th overall, picked by the 49ers in that draft, and he was terrible he start he started i think two games his his rookie year if i remember right um had only a handful of catches his entire time and was out of league by his third or fourth year he completely washed out of league was terrible did not last was absolute cheeks so um, and and understand when you look at rashawn woods mike rumpf and kwame harris all guys that have either been on my honorable mentions or anything. These were guys, three of them were picked in four years uh, with the 49ers. That was, that was a big part of why they, the team was, was in the dark years from 2003 to 2010 um, is when you miss consecutive years in the first round, it is really hard to build a team. It wasn't just the cap problems they had. It was consistently missing on guys. And there was a guy that, up until 2011, you would put on this list. And that was Alex Smith. He was also really struggling to find his way in the league at that time. And he was the number one overall pick in the draft. So those are my top four, four of my top five, four worst 49ers picks of all time from the first round. I'm taking some of y'all down memory lane. This has been fun. Uh, you know, there's some bad picks there for a while, especially over the last like 24 years. There's a lot of misses in that first round, but got to get to number one. I'm taking a drink of coffee, settling myself in for the backlash is about to happen, but I'm going to do it. We're going down this road. The number one worst pick ever for 49ers in the first round is Trey Lance. Look, this isn't saying that Trey Lance may not be a good quarterback as he as he's there in Dallas. We don't know. Trey Lance is the biggest Schrodinger's cat ever. Because, and if you're if you've ever watched Big Bang Theory, you're familiar with them talking about Schrodinger's cat, which is that the there's it's this philosophical idea. There's a cat and you put it in a box. And you have to wonder. Is the cat alive or is the cat dead? You can't open the box and find out. Is the cat alive or is it dead? And because you cannot confirm whether the cat is alive or dead, that it is both at the same time because perceptionally it makes no difference because they are both alive and they're both dead. Trey Lance has both been one of the greatest quarterbacks that the 49ers have ever picked and has been one of the worst quarterbacks the 49ers have ever picked. So... He is a big Schrodinger's cat because there's so much that we don't know. What we do know is that the 49ers did not feel that he was anywhere close to being where they needed as a quarterback to even be number two on the draft draft or on the, the depth chart behind Sam Darnold last year. And when you look at the film from preseason, I think it pretty much showed that as far as his his understanding of an offense, understanding of defenses, understanding of where to read, which side of the field to read, that kind of stuff. Um, understanding of fronts and checks in the run game. Those were not there. Uh, and, and, and look, you know, different people have different, different perceptions on it. People watch the film. Uh, just for me, watching the film, I... I I didn't see anything from Trey Lance that said he warranted even being number two on the draft on the, the depth chart. So, and with that, again, the biggest thing here, I, I think if you look at Jim Drunkenmiller, Ken McAfee, AJ Jenkins, Rashawn Woods, worst actual players than Trey Lance. But 
when you invest three first round picks and one of those is the number three overall pick, that is really hard on your franchise. And what we've been t- we're talking about is the state of the roster, where it is now, where they're really wide but don't have depth, and they're having to pay a lot of guys. This is part of the fallout from that. Yes, you've hit on Brock Purdy. Yes, that is fantastic. I, I would you know take that in a wash. But if it was just one first-round pick or two first-round picks, you can do that. But when you, you essentially have three years of first round picks going back to those guys that I mentioned in the honorable mentions. When you look at Kwame Harris, Mike Rumpf, Rashawn Woods, those are three first round picks in a very short period of time. And how, how hard it was on the team to do anything because missing on those first round picks is really, really tough. Now, again, they didn't have a quarterback. They had a lot of other problems, but that's that. And then when you look at kind of that, that Harbaugh era, why did they have a hard time you know, sustaining that as they went forward, you again look at some of these consecutive misses. Kentuan Balmer, I believe he was 2010, was when Balmer was drafted. So it was right, you know, at the early part of the Harbaugh era. And then you had AJ Jenkins there just a couple of years later, where these these picks are not working out. And so you have a hard time where guys that, you know, you when you have a team built and you miss consecutive years in those first rounds, it really sets the franchise back and it makes it really hard. You've got to really hit on a stud in the third, fourth, fifth round. And the Fortnite have generally done that. But again, why do I put Trey Lance here? Because it's the three first round picks invested into that spot for a guy that in his third season, you're trading him away for a fourth round pick. That's that's hard to swallow. That is hard to take. Um, you know, when we, we look at past it, removing the recency of, you know, the Trey Lance debate, when we look back on Jim Drunkenmiller, nobody says, yeah, he was just, you know, he wasn't he wasn't given the right things around him. He wasn't developed right. He no, we say, ah, oh, yeah, that was a terrible pick. Because he didn't work out. And it was an end of the first round investment in a quarterback when we we have to say put Trey Lance through that same lens and say look Trey Lance has not worked out he didn't work out he's not working out where he is right now okay we'll see where the career goes he may end up with a longer career but when you're as a team invest that much draft capital and it doesn't work out man that's rough that's hard on a team and for me he is the worst overall uh number one overall pick or first round pick by the 49ers. And again, Alex Smith had himself on this list up until uh, he was able to really, you know, bring his turn, his career around. So again, this isn't Trey Lance in, in 10 years may not be on this list. And I would love for him to not be on this list, but as of right now, he is. Let me know how you uh, how you feel and if you agree, disagree with my top five first round picks of all time and bottom five first round picks of all time. So, uh, you know, and and look, also that twenty twenty one draft class is looking really bad. Um, you know, it's not just Trey Lance. You know, you got Zach Wilson is. You got Mac Jones, and you got Justin Fields. Four of these five guys picked in that first round out of that draft class are not on their original team. So, you know, there it is. Uh, We took a trip down memory lane. What we're going to do is we're going to come back to you on Friday this week, and we're going to start going through uh, the the state of the franchise for the defensive side of the ball. Hopefully, Adam will have all of his connection issues figured out. Uh, We'll we'll go through that, and we'll go through a top five, bottom five for second round picks. We're going to see that. Um, You know, they don't hurt quite as much, but but a second round pick is still a valuable pick. And it's, it's, it'll be interesting those, you know, as we get farther down, it's going to be more about the top guys out of, out of those rounds, because, you know, first round, it's really easy to say when a guy was a miss and, and it was hard, you know, like a Kwame Harris and a Mike Rumpf and a Rashawn Woods. When a guy's a sixth round pick and he doesn't work out, you know, it's, it's really hard to start saying, okay, this was the worst sixth round pick, uh, you know, cause 90% of those guys aren't even going to make it through training camp. So, um, you know, the, that's, that's, uh, what we'll, we'll do there. We'll, but we'll go through and see who are some of the, the best. I, I, I think that seventh round pick 
that top five seventh round pick is going to be really tough to figure out who number one is. That's going to be a tough one. We'll see. Uh, also want to give a big uh, shout out and thank you to everybody who donated last month to help uh, a, a, a fundraiser and, and charity focus that we had uh, there uh, last month. I was we're doing everything from the channel to uh, help to a cause to dig water wells around the world. And we were able to raise several hundred dollars off that. So thank you so much uh, for everybody who uh, joined in and helped with that. The the giving for that closed last night. So um, there's still a few things processed from, you know, the exact numbers it takes Google uh, and YouTube a couple days to process that through. Uh, but you know what doesn't take a couple days to process through? When you get your proteins from White Oak Pastures. That's right. Uh, they have been an affiliate with us, and I absolutely love their products. If you've heard, if you've seen my shows, if you've seen what we do, you know I am a huge fan of White Oak Pastures. You, They are a, a, a family-owned, five-generation family-owned farm in Bluffton, Georgia, which is a tiny little town. I live in a small town in Alabama. They are one-tenth of our size. They are itty-bitty town. Out there in Georgia, there is six thousand acre farm that's out there. They employ like ninety percent of their town. They actually, the the company directly employs the the teachers in the school because they are almost the entire town, and uh, and and everybody works there. But they were a, a family that uh, Will Harris and his family decided about thirty years ago that the way that they had been raising food for so long for two generations had really taken a turn from the previous generations. And he was looking at their land and saying, this was not sustainable. We can't keep doing this. We're going to run out of topsoil. We're going to run out of water. We're going to run out of, we're going to have to keep dumping more and more chemicals on our land to try and make it produce things that our cows can be raised on, our pigs can be raised on. And so they they went into a lot of science on it. And they've worked with the universe with Auburn University and other and uh, like University of North Carolina, for example, to figure out how to get back to sustainable farming, not just a way that says we're going to try and get as much food for as low little cost as possible off the land. But how can we make the land produce the most food for as long of time as possible? And that was a move to uh, to not feed, not giving their. Uh, animals any growth hormones they they've they have not done that for decades they have removed almost as many antibiotics as they have they there there's only a couple that they still give their animals they said they've been, they're trying they're working with scientists as much as they can to try and get their animals to be zero antibiotics but most people you know we've heard about the problem of doctors and, and overuse of antibiotics, right? Uh, if you go to the doctor and you have the flu, they're, they're usually a little hesitant about, you know, I don't know if we want to give you an antibiotic. We've been over giving antibiotics for so long. We're starting to create these antibiotic resistant bacterias. And we've been doing this for a long time. Most people don't know over 80% of the antibiotics given in this country are to animals that Human consumption of an antibiotics represents a, a vast minority of the amount of antibiotics that are given out in this country. That the vast majority of them go to animals. That they because the animals live in such unsanitary environments in the way that most of our food is create is is raised and produced. That they have to keep these animals constantly injected and hit up with antibiotics. So they've tried to give their the animals. They spend no time in the bar. They're completely out in the pastures they're able to roam around they're able to soak up vitamin d and then that's delivered to you when you are eating that food um but you can go to whiteoakpastures.com slash jd49 and check out all of their amazing protein options uh they have I, i've been i love their ground beef they have both their ground beef which is a lean it's about 90 10 ground beef it's fantastic and, and again this is these are cows that are 100 grass-fed grass-finished beef they spend all their time out in the pasture they the land is never treated with any sort of uh, commercial fertilizers they use no pesticides they use no herbicides on their land so none of that gets into you what they've actually found is that you know i remember growing up it was a big thing when roundup was you know, which again you're seeing the the commercials now for people who uh, have been exposed to a glyphosate which is roundup that have been getting cancer 
and you, you know, it's like, hey, call this number if you got cancer and you were exposed to glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup. Well, for a long time, they were producing food to try and genetically engineer food so that you could blanket spray an entire crop with Roundup. And it wouldn't kill the crop, but it would kill all the weeds and, and increase the yield. So what they've actually found is almost every person in the United States, they can take a blood sample and find traces of glyphosate in your blood. And that becomes – because, we're again, we're taking those food crops, we're feeding them to the animals, we're producing cereals with them, and that food is – it's then getting passed on to you. And these are not good things to have in your body. Well, they don't use any of that. That's it, You don't have to worry about that with white oak pastures. High-quality proteins. Packed with vitamin D, vitamin E things, very important for your immune system. I will tell you, I switched over to 95% of my proteins come from a white oak pastures. I switched over in October. Most of the time between October and now, I would have been to the doctor three times by now and been given a shot of steroids and antibiotics because you know, we have a lot of things that happen around here. Upper respiratory infections are extremely common. I have not been to the doctor for anything. I have some shoulder bursitis. I went to see him about that. But other than that, I have not been to the doctor yet since I have moved over to White Oak Pastures. I feel better. It's helped my my body. I am I'm actively being healthier. So, you know, where do you want to spend your money? Do you want to spend it a little bit more on some proteins that help you feel better and you don't go to the doctor? Or do you try and save money on those things by getting cheaper food and you end up having to go to the doctor more often? And, you know, it's just, it's just, is what it is. We're, our, our food companies are really good at marketing. They say, we're not going to tell you it's cheaper produced food. It's things like superior marbling. It's things like more tender. What it is, it's, these food companies are not interested in producing and giving you the highest quality food they can. They're interested in giving you the highest quantity of food for the highest profit. And I'm not, I'm not bagging on profits. Okay. Look, I, I companies need to make profit. They need to exist, but food companies are incentivized not to produce food that is good for you, but is food that will maximize cost. So they're, they're, what they do is that what they feed these animals is not based upon what's good for the animal. It's based upon what's the cheapest calories available to make that animal as large as possible so that they are selling you a product by the pound to produce as many pounds out of each animal as they can. So you know, a lot of times your beef, these cows are sometimes being fed uh, molasses mixed with chicken manure. Why? And, and then they'll turn around and say that it's grain fed because there were some grains involved. And then they say it was better. Well, what it was is it was a really cheap way to fatten up that cow. It was a really cheap way to do that. They'll, they'll, they'll give them corn syrup, and now they're corn-fed. That's the way they do it. And then they tell you it's a better product. They say superior marbling. But I will tell you, uh, the quality of meat that has come out of White Oak Pastures is absolutely fantastic. Check them out, whiteoakpastures.com slash JD49. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, – and 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 hanging out with us and look, Terrera Domes, he's got it. He's got it nailed it on here. He says some countries that ban our food, and it's absolutely true. Actually, a lot of the beef now that you're getting, um, because some of the beef in the United States is not even meet U.S. standards, is coming out of Mexico. We're getting a lot of that stuff. So, uh, and then Glass City's asking when will the next member only video be out? I'm shooting for uh, two videos this week, one on Thursday, one on Friday. So, um. Route tree video. We're getting real close to, to finishing that up. And then we're going to start going into a deep dive on cover three. Last time we went into a deep dive on cover two. And I'll, I'll be able to make that, that video a little shorter because I'm not doing the complete overview of the different zone coverages. But I'm going to go into a deep dive on the coverage rules of cover three. So we'll have cover two and then cover three. And then after that, I'm going to work to cover four. And then that's what's going to be a little bit interesting because we're going to, there's a couple different ways of playing cover four there. And then we'll work through some man coverages and then we'll start working on pressure packages. That's what I, re I really want to develop the entire defensive playbook. And then you know, having the route tree video, then start getting into the run game. And what I'm also looking at doing is I've, I've been really going forth, back and forth on this. I think I'm going to uh, give our members exclusive a link um, hosted on our site to, it's going to be a YouTube video, but it's going to be to uh, um, to uh, Alex Gibbs, um, who it's one of his teaching videos from a coaching session. So I'll, I'm looking at also curating some content through there so that it's a little easier for people to find because I've lost, I've also looked at, um, at how, you know, look, I could sit there and try and explain wide zone and I can do it, but can I do it as well as the guy who invented it, who really, you know, 
invented it and taught it in the NFL for 25 years. Um, he's got about an hour long video. It's a great video. Um, you know, so do I curate some stuff or, you know, find and finding some of these guys who are really, really good at explaining some of this stuff and, and add some curate curating in there uh, again, I could I could explain it. I don't think I can do it as well as Gibbs. Just, I've looked, I watched his, his video several times. You know, we're talking about a guy who's literally taught this hundreds of times in his life, um, that he's got it down and he's got it down. How, how quickly do what I may do is do some introduction on some terms that he's going to use and then have that in there. So, um, that's, that's, uh, what we're probably going to be doing there on the members website. So those are some things coming down the pipeline, but thank you guys for, uh, for, tuning in with us keeping uh, in with us and hopefully adam will be back with us next time and he'll have all his connect connection issues done but uh if you're watching this afterwards leave it in the comments what is your number one best 49ers first round pick of all time what is your number one worst 49ers first round pick of all time let me know in there but thank you guys for tuning in until next time stay safe stay healthy and go Niners!